So welcome to today's webinar. Uh, today we will be discussing some of the risky aspects of shipping internationally and some of the ways you can mitigate that risk. My name is Meredith Lambert and I will be the, your host for today's webinar. I am the marketing manager here at Trade Risk Guarantee, which translates into being responsible for researching and creating the educational content for all of you. Joining me today is Felicia Donahue, the Marine Insurance Manager here at TRG. With seven and a half years in the industry, she is a certified, oh sorry, she is certified in Marine Insurance Management and oversees the underwriting of marine insurance policies at TRG. She helps importers of all sizes, but has extensive experience in the more complicated situations. Also joining me today is Travis Smith. He is the VP of sales here at TRG, and with 10 years of experience helping importers and exporters protect their cargo while it is in transit. This webinar is being presented by Trade Risk Guarantee. We are located in the heart of downtown Bozeman, Montana. We operate on a direct to importer business model, which is unique to the international trade community since it cuts out the need for an additional middleman and allows TRG to become an additional partner in your international trade. We will be recording this webinar and it will be available on YouTube for future reference. If you want to be notified the moment it releases, I highly recommend you subscribe to our YouTube channel. We also post additional educational videos on YouTube about once a month to every couple months. So if you are not already, go ahead and subscribe. You can find us by searching trade risk guarantee hyphen TRG in the YouTube search. A link to subscribe will also be sent out with the webinar recording as a follow-up to today's attendees. During the webinar, please submit your questions in the question box in the webinar interface throughout the presentations. We will be answering as many of them as we can at the end. However, if you have a question during the presentation um, and you submit it and we're not able to get to it, one of our team of experts will reach out shortly after the webinar. As a quick reminder, this presentation is for educational purposes only and does not constitute legal advice. Today's presentation is going to cover three primary topics. The risk of shipping internationally. Then we will be going over a few examples of newsworthy events and then covering some steps you can directly take to protect yourself. So now I'm gonna go ahead and pass the mic over to Felicia to begin the presentation. Thank you, Meredith. Um, so I think sometimes it's easy for shippers to not always realize the, the reality that when they're importing or exporting, they're really relying on a lot of other parties. Um, you're relying on people to properly pack and store and load your cargo, and you don't have control over everything they do in that process. You also don't have control over what is being shipped with your goods. Uh, for example, in the case of you shipping a less than container load, you can't even control what other commodities are being shipped with your goods. Uh, for example, you know, really common example that we give in training is you really don't ever want to see crystal champagne flutes being shipped in the same container as bowling balls. Uh, it's just a recipe for disaster. And as the importer, you really don't have a lot of control over that. Some commodities require a lot more handling or specific methods of shipping. And so when you don't physically have your goods, it's really hard to actually control and ensure proper handling along the whole way. Um, you're relying on others to make good choices with your cargo, but the person with the most interest in your cargo being handled safely is you. So you really need to take control and manage what you do have control over. One of the other, you know, big 
risks with shipping cargo is misdeclared cargo. So if a shipper fills out a form incorrectly or um, you know something goes awry, most likely the only time someone's going to know about it is when something goes wrong and it's something big usually. Uh, many times a misdeclaration of cargo is a mistake um, that the shipper may not be aware of, um, but intentionally misdeclared cargo does happen as well. There, there is a financial incentive to misdeclare high-risk cargo, especially uh, because then there's less work for forms being filed. Special precautions don't have to be taken. You don't have to pay for special handling or special stowage. Um, you can't control the actions of others, but their actions can directly impact you. So even if your service providers are doing everything perfectly, you're also relying on other shippers service providers and the other shippers to act prudently and safely so that your cargo isn't impacted. And talking about misdeclared cargo, we need to hit on commodities that are shipped that we're seeing more and more of that are increasing the risk, the risk of damage and, and, and big events. One of those commodities are lithium ion batteries. They're being used in everyday, um, everyday goods. You can take e-bikes as an example. Here in Bozeman, we're seeing them on the trails more, we're seeing them on the streets more, and you can expect the use of e-bikes and lithium ion batteries to increase throughout our society, uh, which is good. It's convenient, but there are risks with lithium ion batteries. Um, we have seen repeated events of e-bikes exploding, the lithium ion battery overheating and causing fires. Um, one website recorded 70 incidents since 2017, and the frequency of these incidents of lithium ion batteries causing a fire are increasing as the years go by. And I also think it's important to just look at both sides of this particular situation where this cargo wasn't seen as dangerous. So it impacted not only the people who owned the e-bikes e in the shipping containers that, where they exploded, but also the containers around them. And we're gonna see that in a couple examples here in, in a couple of slides. Another thing we're seeing in international shipping is damaged or old containers. And this is a big one. We've seen unprecedented demand for containers and shipping companies have reacted. One step they've taken was to continue to use equipment that ordinarily would have been retired from service. This has led to an increase in incidents involving container leaks and concerns about container stacking issues. When containers are loaded onto a, a shipping vessel, they're stacked corner on corner, and the, the containers are engineered to be able to hold that weight of containers on top of each other. But with older containers continue to be in use, the risk of that structural integrity increases. The, the locking mechanism may not fully lock. The container may not be able to hold the weight of the goods stored in the containers above it. Um, we'll go into detail in a couple of slides here about what your company can do to help ensure the container that your goods are in is actually um, in good shape. Yeah, I, I would say this type of claim in particular has increased so much in the last two years um, with containers continuing to be used when they normally would have been retired. Uh, it seems like more than any other type of claim, this this has increased um, since the, the shortage of containers started becoming a real topic of discussion. And Felicia, when you say this, water damage. Water damage and stacking issues, both of them. Okay. And, you know, th this might sound obvious that a shipping line shouldn't be using old containers, but we're seeing the claims happen, and we're going to talk about what your company can do to help protect against this. And then examples of newsworthy incidents. There have been massive examples. Here we go. The story of the Mas Maersk Kerman. A major fire broke out in the number three forward cargo hold of the Maersk Kerman in March of 2018. The ship continued to burn into April. Uh, the ship was carrying over 7,000 containers at the time of the fire, 
the investigation into the cause concluded in October in October 2020 and no cause was conclusively determined. When these fires on shipping containers happen, they are hot and especially in this example, the, the smoke and the fumes caused by the fire are toxic. This greatly complicates the first responders' ability to get to the fire and put it out. And as we're gonna see in this slide, the cargo hold was, was destroyed. Goods were, were disintegrated and melted. And you can see why it becomes impossible in some cases to determine what caused the fire. Um, with any, you know, you gotta think there were flammable goods like lithium yep. ion batteries yep. or something that yep. was not handled properly. And, you know, once a fire starts, you have no control over whether it's going to go toward combustible chemicals or finished goods or, or what. The, there's just no way to control that massive of a fire. Um, and I think the big thing here to remember also is you see all of those shipping containers that were destroyed. And there's no concluded cause of where the what caused this fire so really there is no one for all of those cargo owners to hold liable for the loss of their cargo and that damage and even if there were um likely it would be a minimum of a 10-year litigation process to hold anyone liable um, and that's just the nature of international trade litigation uh, it's just unavoidable In 2015, we saw the Tangent Port explosions. This was a series of explosions that occurred at a container storage station in Tangent, China. There were three initial explosions and eight additional ones caused by resulting fire. Large quantities of intermodal container stacks were toppled and thrown by the forces of the explosion. In total, over 300 buildings, 12,000 cars, and 7,000 intermodal containers were damaged. Official reports listed 173 dead and 797 injured. This was a big event. Um, an investigation into the cause concluded in February of 2016 found that an overheated container of dry nitrocellulose was the cause of the initial explosion. So what, what does an explosion at an overseas storage location have to do with companies that ship internationally? And here you can see in the picture, <laughs> this, was, this was a big event. There was a crater and multiple warehouses were destroyed. There are residential um, skyscrapers right there in the background. So Felicia, you, had, you, you went through a claim experience. I did. As a result. Um, TRG had one one client, a low, small US-based company with cargo um, in the Tianjin port. They were actually had equipment that they were importing in the warehouse kitty corner to where the, the explosion was centered. So their, their cargo did not exist uh, after this event. There was no finding it. It, it went into that crater. Um, and so the only way you know, photos we got from that was basically a, a drone photo with a red circle around the portion of the hole where the warehouse used to be located. And, you know, it, it's a certainty that so many of those containers in that, in that photo were destined to the U.S. And, you know, even, you know, to put it into perspective, all of those, you know, lines that just look like crop lines, all of those are vehicles, mo many of which were destined for the U.S. It was incredibly widespread. Now, many of you listening may be shipping on FOB INCO terms, in which case you take ownership at the US, uh, at the foreign port when the goods cross the rail of the boat. But at the same time, uh, a lot of US importers are importing on XWorks INCO terms, in which case this event would have um, impacted their goods. Or they didn't know what their trade terms were and so it was you know figuring things out after the fact um, when everything was confusing and you know not only were they trying to figure out who was responsible for what they were trying to figure out what was going on with their cargo if it even still existed and then our final example is the yantian express on january 3rd 2019 a fire broke out in a container stowed on the deck of the yantian 260 containers were destroyed uh, and the fire burnt for seven days. 
460 other containers were inspected for probable damage. On January 25th, 2019, a general average, clear, uh, general average event was declared. The likely cause of this fire was misdeclared, uh, was misdeclared cargo. A container was declared, a container with declared cargo of coconut pellets was actually a cargo of coconut charcoal, also known as pyrocar. So, you know, that, that basically means combustible goods were not treated as combustible goods. And um, so it's not really the, the shipping line's fault that this happened, but you know that that happens misdeclared cargo does happen there is it, there are accidents and and it can happen on purpose like we talked about before and the big thing to remember with this event is this was a the Yonsen Express is a mega container ship and so even after the cargo the, the fire was managed where the fire began and where the ship was located it could not physically fit into any of the nearby ports it was too big of a draw and so it just had to continue going along the coastline until it got to a port that could actually accommodate it and you know as more con mega container ships are being used that's that's a, a higher probability of that happening on future events um, it only takes one shipper to cause this kind of an event. And with you, mega container ships, there's more people involved. So there's more chances for misdeclared cargo to happen or for mishandling by the shipping line to happen. There's just so many more parties involved. There's just more eggs in one basket. Yep. And then when that basket catches on fire, where do you put it? It's hard to find a port for those mega ships. Yep. So this is a photo from the Antien Express after um, they got to a port of refuge and, and began clearing it out. And you can see, you know, not only were containers, you know, destroyed by the fire, they were also impacted by the smoke and by the firefighting operations to put the fire out. So now let's get into a little bit about you know how to protect yourself uh, we don't want to just scare you guys with with every all of the possibilities of what could happen so the first step is you know be proactive i i always think of it as being reactive rather than proactive means you're trading on goodwill um just recently i i concluded a claim with a client who first tried to file you know a loss with the carrier, with the shipping line. And it took a full year for the shipping line to respond to her and basically say, no, we're not going to pay you. Um, and they weren't out of line with saying that. That was what the, the terms of service said when the goods were shipped with that shipping line. So you can't just rely on, on the people that you're doing business with on doing things out of the goodness of their heart. Um, at the end of the day, it's business and carriers are only going to do what they contractually have to do. They're only going to pay you when they they legally are liable to you, um, which isn't as often as I think a lot of importers think they are. Um, the other thing I'll say is, you know, have written expectations and procedures with your logistics providers. They are, you know, going to be working with you and for you. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with having expectations and, and having protocols in place that you expect to be followed. A uh, really good example is, you know, for those old or damaged cargo containers that we were talking about, a great protocol to have in place with your supplier is to require that they do a light test on your container before they start loading it. So they just go in the container, they close the doors and they see if any light is coming through. If there's any light or any evidence of, of water damage on the floor, then they should be expected to reject that container and get a different one. Um, it might make your shipment take longer because they have to get a different container, but that is still better than having your cargo damaged by water or being crushed. You know, another possibility is to require that they take photos or video of the container before and after stowage to show and give you evidence that they are doing a good job with your cargo. Um, it is absolutely a normal convention. And if 
you're paying them, then it's completely reasonable for you to have those expectations. So have them inspect the container and document the inspection before they load the goods. Yeah. Um, it, it is better to be preventative and avoid shipping cargo in a, a compromised container. That is best practices. That is best practice, and companies across the U.S. do it. If you're yep. not doing it now, start implementing it. And that term, trading on goodwill, that that's really big. A lot of companies in the U.S. might not pay for goods until after the goods have arrived, but depending on their inco terms, they own the goods. Maybe when the goods cross the rail of the boat at the foreign port or when they arrive at the U.S. port, is the supplier still going to require payment if the goods arrive damaged? Uh, it depends. Contractually, they might. Um, they totally can. It's it's just like if you have a, a home home mortgage and the house burns down, the bank still expects you to pay. So the next point that I'll I'll, I'll touch on a little bit is vet your logistics provider. Um, this may be you know a little overwhelming, but talk to other people in the industry that that have good logistics providers that they really like. Um, not only are you getting more personal feedback on how they do, um, mentioning that you've been referred could also make you more of a valued customer, that they care about doing a good job for you rather than just a number. Um, and just interview your logistics providers. You know, the, the weakest point in your supply chain is your your service providers so just make sure that that chain isn't going to get broken while your goods are in transit uh, and then the next point that i'm going to go over just briefly is make sure you're shipping in and out of ports with good infrastructure um, i can't tell you how many times i've seen claims for overturned trucks when they were on the way to the port in India. It's just because of the infrastructure and, you know, loss of goods on a truck coming from Mexico to the U.S. It's just the nature of the region. And so talking with your logistics provider and making sure you are picking the safest route is important. And that might seem overwhelming, but that's where finding good logistics providers that can give you good advice comes in. Talk to them, make a plan, talk to them about your priorities. Um, if you don't really have a whole lot of choices of, of a safe route within a country that you're doing business um, to get it in or get it out of the country, maybe consider changing your terms of sale or your inco terms to something that will make it so you're it's not your responsibility if something happens within that country um i don't want to dig into inco terms too much here but we do have a lot of other video resources on that topic um, if you're interested in learning more about that And then, so th the next point is to act as if you are the only one paying for mistakes. This is advice that I see a lot from claim specialists. And the reason I say this is typically when you act as though you're the one that's gonna have to pay for everything if something happens, then you're going to make smarter choices. Um, you're gonna act a little more conservatively if it's all on your head. And, you know, ultimately, it's better to avoid anything happening. Um, you might have fantastic insurance that pays you out 100% of what your claim is for, but your insurance company still can't pay you back in lost time or lost customer trust, or they can't pay you back for lost sales for because you know cargo went missing and you had to reorder. Um, and they can't pay you back your deductible. All of those are going to be resources that you lose because a loss happened and so ultimately it's better for your business if you just avoid anything happening to the best of your ability and then the last point that i'll, I'll go over is have marine cargo insurance as a safety net um, this is a just in case it's a safety net um, it's important that you have a, a whole risk management strategy and in insurance is 
an important component, but it's only one part. That's why there are five points here. Um, and taking the steps that we've already talked about before this are probably going to make your marine cargo insurance more affordable as well. So make sure you've got a well-rounded strategy for, for protecting your company's interests in your cargo. And when you take those first four steps and get to the fifth step of this cargo insurance, make sure your agent knows that you're taking these steps because it should impact your premium like Felicia mentioned. Yeah, um, a, a proactive importer is going to be much more appealing to insurers. They're going to be more motivated to win your business. Underwriters all day long see the same application for companies importing from China, but then the, that one out of 20 application that shows they're inspecting containers prior to loading, that shows they're uh, requesting that trucks only travel on the highway during daylight hours, that makes a difference. It does. So with having said that, um, I want to go over just real quick, what does cargo insurance cover? And so marine cargo insurance is a, a little bit of a misnomer. Uh, sometimes it can be a little misleading. It, it covers pretty much anything in transit from point A to point B. Ideally, it should be written custom to how you are doing business. Um, you don't necessarily want a cookie cutter policy for marine insurance. You want to work with an insurer who's going to really custom write it to how you do business. Um, because marine insurance is very, very flexible. Uh, kind of the sky is the limit. It, it can be hand underwritten to, to fit most situations. And, you know, just also bear in mind that marine cargo insurance doesn't only cover ocean transits. That's why I say it's a bit of a misnomer. It can also include air freight, carrier, um, um, uh, railroad, um, even barge. Uh, ocean barge is something that I, I occasionally see. So no matter how you're shipping, just make sure you're talking with your agent and they know what kind of coverages you need. Um, because it's such a broad, vast type of coverage, really make sure you're working with an agent who's going to dig into it and get a good application from you and really understand your business. Um, the application is so key to the policy. It, it, it does become part of the policy. So make sure if your shipping practices are changing that you're also consulting with your agent and making sure no gaps are cropping up in your coverage. The, the application should be revisited annually. Sometimes we see companies that haven't adjusted their application from when the policy was first put in place five years ago, and that, that's a big red flag. So, yeah, make sure your coverage is current. Um, if you get this amazing opportunity that you didn't plan on when you you instituted your policy, 99.9% .9 of the time, ins the insurance company is going to be able to modify your policy to fit that particular situation. Um, that's one of the benefits and one of the beauties of marine cargo insurance is it, it's it's so flexible for what an importer or an exporter needs. Um, so make sure you're also finding an insurer that's going to work with you. Not saying insurance companies are going to accommodate everything. Yeah. But you can go for it. Yeah. It never hurts to ask. And, you know, the insurers that I know and I work with, um, you get a feel for who's going to be able to accommodate what. And so you really try to find the right fit. Okay, so now we're gonna open up the discussion for any questions. Uh, remember to submit your questions in the question box in the webinar interface um, so we can have Felicia and Travis start to answer some of those. This is kind of your shot to get them while they're on the call. So while we're gathering questions from the audience, I would like to take a moment to talk about TRG. At TRG, we sell directly to consumers. So rather than purchase through a third party, we're going to help you out by letting you buy direct. And that gives you an option for lower pricing and very competitive customer service and claims assistance. In addition to providing U.S. Customs bonds, we also write all-risk annual cargo insurance policies. 
We are also proud to announce that we are able to offer more flexible pricing options, options than ever before um, in an effort to help importers protect their cargo while protecting their immediate cash flow. All of our policies are written through Lloyd's of London, AXA XL, Liberty Mutual, or Hudson Insurance Markets. We offer local representation, so if you have a loss, you will be speaking directly with Felicia and her team. But that doesn't mean we can't handle a loss anywhere. We have representatives around the world ready to help in the case of a loss to make sure you get paid the right amount quickly. Finally, our policies are custom with with choices including international, domestic, and warehouse coverage. And they are wrapped around your business. These are not off-the-shelf policies. These are policies written directly for you based on your business, making sure you have the coverage you need. Our all-risk annual policies start at some of the lowest annual costs in the market. All right, so let's uh, take a look at any questions that have been submitted. Um, if you guys want to take the mic again. All right, so first question I'm seeing is, does marine insurance cover someone smuggling goods by putting them in your container or ships rerouting through ports the U.S. has sanctioned? Um, both of these are great questions, so I'm going to tackle them kind of piecemeal. Um, so the first one about smuggling, great question. Um, basically, if your goods are damaged by someone else's actions that you were not aware of and did not have control over, um, the beauty of an all-risk policy is as long as you weren't doing anything illegal, it's going to cover you for physical damage. Um, liability is something else that marine insurance would not be able to cover, but definitely check with you know, your, your typical business or commercial insurance provider to make sure you have sufficient liability coverage. Um, for ships being rerouted, typically, if it's on a U.S. transit, it's not going to be rerouted to a port where the U.S. has sanctioned. Um, usually, the ship can't go there because of where the ship is flagged from. Um, that being said, if your goods ever do travel through a sanctioned region, um, U.S. insurers are still bound by um, U.S. sanctions, so they would not be able to cover what is considered an illegal shipment um, or, or that sort of thing. Uh, for example, right now, you know, Russia has been sanctioned for pretty much all trade. Um, most insurers have basically said, if you want to do business in Russia or through Russia, you need to talk to us first so that we can make sure it's a legal shipment and we can know that it is a legal shipment on your policy in case a claim does come in. So my advice would be in any sort of situation of rerouting, if you're uncertain, just check with your insurer um, and, and they're gonna be able to give you a much more concrete answer. And then the next question that I see here is what is all risk insurance? Um, all risk insurance is pretty much the broadest type of marine cargo insurance out there. And it is a little different than I, what I think most people are used to with insurance, where it basically covers all chance occ occurrences except for what is explicitly excluded. Um, so an example of a few typical exclusions are delay, um, because delay typically doesn't cover actually cause physical damage, even though it can cause a commercial loss. Um, marine insurance only covers, you know, physical loss. So um, if it just takes longer to get to you, it's not going to be able to cover that commercial loss. Um, so, and if I could jump in, Carol, I mean, I, I think about this all the time from a client's perspective. Number one, cargo insurance covers if the goods are lost, stolen, or damaged. So delay, the goods aren't lost, stolen, or damaged. You know, loss of market due to delay, rejection by U.S. Customs, the goods are not lost, stolen, or damaged. So we get those questions pretty frequently. Those are not covered. Um, if, if the goods are delayed and they sit at port for an extra two weeks, and during that time, the container gets jabbed by a forklift and water gets into the container, then you have a claim. Then the, the goods are damaged. So um, I would think, number one, 
cargo insurance covers lost, stolen, or damaged goods. Number two, you want to look at your application. Going back to what Felicia said, you want to make sure what you described to the insurance company on your application is, is what you do in your shipping practice. So revisit that. And number three, the policies start as all risk, and then there are common exclusions that are written in. These exclusions are generally very, um, very acceptable, I would say. Like for example, they feel fairly common sense. Common sense. I mean, there's yeah. one. There's one exclusion that excludes damage due to electromagnetic um, weapons. Yeah. And I, I mean, so those exclusions that are written in should be highlighted by your agent. And I mean, internally at TRG, we have a safe check called a, a quote flag. So there's communication internally to make sure any exclusions are highlighted to the client and the client's comfortable with them and they're aware of them. These exclusions keep the premium down and typically they're very reasonable. Yeah, and I think another good example of a typical exclusion is cargo that was already damaged before it shipped. Um, so you can't ship rotten turnips and then expect to file a claim because the turnips show up rotten if, you know? the, if the tv arrives and there's no indication of damage to the container or mishandling but in, in the tvs aren't smashed but they just don't work then your supplier put bad tvs in the container so that's not covered either yeah another question i see here is what is the difference between having a bond and marine insurance or is it the same thing so i'm going to let you take that one so uh, the bond the u.s customs importer bond is a financial guarantee to u.s customs that if the importer of record fails to pay money owed to customs duties taxes fines penalties then the insurance company that underwrites the bond is liable to customs for that money in the event that the insurance company pays out to U.S. Customs, uh, then the insurance company will continue to try to collect that money from the importer of record. So the bond is, is completely different than cargo insurance. They overlap in the sense that they both deal with international trade, but the bond, the customs importer bond, does not protect the importer. The importer is required to have it to be the importer of record, but the bond protects U.S. Customs. Cargo insurance, um, as we have spoke about throughout this webinar, it, it is more traditional insurance. It is intended to protect the insured. It protects the insured if the goods are lost, stolen, or damaged while in transit. So the bond and cargo insurance, two totally different things. Please don't confuse them. It can lead to a, a lot of heartache. Oh, is there insurance that covers general average? Absolutely. Um, I love this question. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> even if you're getting, from everything I've been told, even if you're getting the most cutthroat, you know, cheapest insurance out there, it covers general average. I, we haven't seen, you know, there's there's coverage you can get from your supplier overseas, from an overseas insurance agency that can be complicated and overwhelming. There's, you know, per shipment insurance you can secure through U.S. logistics companies, or you can get an annual policy. All of those cover general I mean we yeah. can't necessarily speak for every single situation out there but yeah they do cover general average yeah most pol most coverage that you can get whether it's a per shipment or an annual policy is going to cover general average um I think some people don't realize you could in theory have two different claims on a single general average event um because you could have your cargo just damaged in whatever caused the general average event so if there's a fire and your your container burns up um you need to fit file just a normal cargo insurance claim for property loss um if your cargo was damaged by the efforts to put out the fire then you have a a share of the general average contribution that everyone else is going to have to pay into into the general average event but it typically takes about 10 years for that to be finalized and you don't want to just be sitting around waiting that whole time for for people to pay you back um so you could also in theory have that paid by your insurers right then and then they get your share of the contribution once it's figured out um and then you know the second claim is going to be just for your contribution if your cargo isn't damaged or some of your cargo is and some isn't you could still owe a, 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 an average guarantee and an average bond to the shipping line yeah, you, before you they'll will. release your cargo. Yeah, you will yeah. if your goods were on that boat that was that the general yeah. average was declared. Um, it's it's non-negotiable. They, they will hold your cargo until you provide that guarantee, um, whether it is through an insurance policy or a cash bond. Um, those are pretty much your only options. If 
because like I said, it can take up to 10 years. And if you just abandon your cargo, the shipping line or the average adjuster absolutely can just sell your cargo and sue you for the difference. Um, so the only two choices are really either to pay an upfront cash bond um, and you have no idea what that amount will be. It's based on, on the cost of the general average event in proportion to your cargo value um, or have your insurance company provide a guarantee. Uh, and the other big thing with general average, because pretty much everyone provides the coverage, I think the big thing is who's going to help you through that process. Um, general average can be really confusing um, and you don't know who to talk to because there's so many people involved. And so having someone who speaks the same language as you and understands what the process is and can help you through that process, I think is super key. So we, correct, Felicia, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a general average claim. It's it's made known who hasn't placed a bond or provided their cargo insurance. So if you're a shipper without insurance and you haven't placed the bond, the other companies on the boat know that you're the one slowing down the process. I've, I've heard major retailers reach out to the small guy and say, what's going on? You need to resolve this. That, that's yeah, a yeah. If, if they're talking with the average adjuster, you know, it's not kept a secret. Um, and, you know, especially with mega container ships, some of the little guys who don't know what the process is or what they're supposed to do can really slow down that process. And so having someone who can guide you through it as soon as you get a notice, and even if it's just for them to say, no, you don't have to do anything, uh, it's the other party's responsibility, at least then you know, and that will keep everyone's cargo moving faster. And then, Felicia, you mentioned there's no way to anticipate what the cost of a general average claim could be. Now, these cargo policies, uh, cargo coverage has a per loss limit, but with general average... Nope, there's no limit and there's no deductible for your general average contribution. Because there's no way to anticipate what the general average claim or amount yeah. could possibly be. So it's covered without a limit. Um, so another question that I'm seeing is, you know, what about acts of God coverage? Uh, a lot of policies will exclude acts of God. and one of the beauties of, of all risk coverage is acts of God isn't really a thing. Um, that's kind of the point. They are true fortuities is, is what the insurance company would say, which is basically something you can't control. So an act of God to an, to a, to an, a cargo insurance insurer is a fortuity. Part for the course. It's, for, it's, What's a what it's for it's what the coverage is for, something you can't control. Yeah, so pretty much all of the newsworthy examples we gave were what people would probably call an act of God. Um, I handled a claim on all of them, and all of them were resolved quickly for the client. Um, to be honest, acts of God are kind of much more cut and dry. There's no gray of is this covered or not. All right, so we've gone a little bit over uh, the time, but you know, the, there were some really good questions submitted, so I wanted to give a little extra time for our guys to answer those. Um, but if you did ask an additional question and we didn't have time to get to it, we will try to reach out to you um, to get any, especially any pressing questions answered. Uh, so yeah, thank you for taking the time today to attend our webinar. If you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to either me directly uh, via email at marketing at traderiskguarantee.com or to either one of our speakers on today's webinar. Their contact information was at the beginning, but again, we will be sending out this recording um, for you to get that information. Additionally, check out our blog at traderiskguarantee.com slash trgpeak. It's got a treasure trove of excellent articles and information. And don't forget to find us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and of course, YouTube. We will be sending up a follow-up email tomorrow with links from the presentation. So also keep an eye on your inbox for that. Thank you again for attending.